basically, has been enabled. basically, what happened was I felt that I had to set up a, if you like, some kind of structure in the madness. Did you heat it up too much? Sorry? I'm sorry. Um, uh, you're, yeah, I had it right. I think uh, we've got somebody who's new, whose uh, audio is still on. Hearing oh, some, uh, sorry, sorry about that. It's okay. Go ahead. So anyway, go ahead, Simon. Right. So I felt I had to sort of create some kind of structure um, to control the madness. Provide, if you like, a central pivot from wherever, how far I went from that central point. I always had that central point to return to. So in a way, it was um, it was almost a necessity of providing myself with some kind of structure to stabilize what I was doing and to make it more consistent. But, but it's not. But it's not. Uh, you're not saying that acceptance is an end point, and it means that uh, you're totally okay with it. Um. I think if you're totally okay with acceptance, you've still got some work to do. Okay. <laughs> I, very, I, very Simon, it's Sue, may I jump in? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that acceptance is a journey and it's not necessarily a goal. Um, in dialectic behavioral therapy, behavior therapy, what we talk about is constantly turning the mind. And when you come to it, okay, you're shaking your head, so I'm good so far. Um, no, not, yeah. <laughs> yes, when you come to a decision point and you really want to make a decision based on what you want or what your life used to be, you have to stop and actually turn yourself towards the reality of what you are now and acceptance of what the parameters are of what you are now. Now, why weren't you sitting on my shoulder when I was writing my book? Oh, hell, I don't know. <laughs> why didn't you call me? That's beautiful. Hey, book. You could have called I have, me. I've been around for a while, you know? I have, Simon, I have, Simon, I have been trying to tell her she needs to write a book for six years now. So uh, you're going to have to work yeah. on her. So, I will. Go ahead. I will. Uh, go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I, yeah, I, think, we're, I think we're both saying the same thing. Uh, my, my mantra is until you actually use what you got now rather than what you had, you, you're not going to get anywhere. Because all you're going to, all that's going to happen is you're going to be doing the wrong things well and getting into all <laughs> kinds of pickles. And that yeah. doesn't help. Um, yeah. I think moving on is where you are prepared to enter um, a process of renaissance where you reinvent yourself as your skills develop. Now we do this all our lives. We, we reinvent ourselves every day of our lives, one way or another. But with sight loss, you've got to be even more focused about it because as you develop your skills, you're going to change. And you're going to change quite dra uh, dramatically, and uh, and also that is going to enable you to start to think about what you think is possible. Which again is something we do all our lives, but again with sight loss is something you have to do consciously. It, uh -huh. I believe that dealing with sight loss, managing sight loss, is very much a case of constantly pushing the boundaries out. So that you never stand still. It is, it is one of the most, dare I say it, it's one of the most beautiful learning experiences you can ever have if you choose to embrace it. Because there is so much to learn. And at 68 or so, to have to, as it were, go back into the university of life was a real rare and wonderful privilege and it taught me so much. Um, if we go, but if you're going to do that, you've got to have some kind of baseline, some kind of um, foothold, some kind of foundation from which to move. And those, looking back, 
and I suppose at the time I sort of semi-realised were my rules of engagement. There's nothing very profound about them, very, very obvious. First one, as I said, is um, accept your sight loss, because until you've done that, you're not going to do anything. You're, you're going to be stuck in a, um, a mesh of sad memories and failed attempts at trying to do what you could do. So Who doesn't... Uh, I'm sorry. Sue, doesn't dialectic behavior uh, therapy say that, let's see, looking back is uh, where you have the depression and looking forward is where you have the anxiety? If you, you it talks very much about mindfulness, Simon. It's so yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. And being in the oh. moment, because if you're looking back and you have regrets, that's depression. If yeah. you're, you know, and if you're looking forward and you have fears, that's anxiety. Or if you're looking forward, um, surely we can translate into a necessary state, a necessary state of arousal to deal with the new challenges. Okay, that's that's, that's the pot. Yeah, that's the positive way that's to look at it. I, that's the positive. I'm a psychologist. I have to. I deal with a lot of people with problems. But another thing that I wanted to add... I only do with myself, and that's bad enough. That's bad enough. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> my heavens. Um, anyway, basically, there are... In, and also in DBT, they, we also say there are four ways of handling a problem. The first way is to solve it. The second way is to improve your general life experience so that you're happier about other things. The third way is to tolerate. And the fourth way is to be miserable. And so many of our clients, and I think I can talk also from what I hear from Lynn about, you know, people in the group, we get stuck in trying to solve it. And we, when we can't solve it, we go to number four, which is stay miserable. There's a well, whole so huh? This again, this again is where you stay. I mean, I, I, I make the point. Um, you can either laugh or you can cry, and if you cry, nobody takes any notice, and you might as well laugh and try and get on and change the way you look at the problem. Yeah, life is well, the that change, that ever change what you think is possible. Right. And that brings really that brings us into Simon's second rule, which is treat obstacles as an opportunity to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Right. This is um. This is. <sighs> Be quiet. Shut up. <laughs> Sorry, somebody has had brass neck to actually go across their field about 100 yards away. <laughs> you can feel, don't you know? Yeah, I know. Sorry about that. Be don't quiet. worry about it. Hey, you should hear my house. Well, don't worry time, about it. We had, your, we had your parrot. This time you got my senses. Um, yeah, this is an unashamed steal from the military. During training, you got these enormous, hairy NCO, sorry, non-commissioned officers yelling at us. Um, don't just lie there. Solve the problem. Improvise, adapt, overcome, move it. You know, and it does give you a certain, um, I suppose, very positive attitude to life. But at the end of the day, um, problems are there to be solved. And if you regard them as opportunities to actually find solutions by improvising, adapting, and overcoming, um, a lot of the fear goes out of the problem. In fact, it's a non-problem um, because it, it becomes an interesting challenge instead. And all, so many times it's not what you say, it's how you say it that's so important. And if you can persuade yourself of that, then you're going to look at a problem and say, oh, good, an interesting challenge, rather than, oh, God, not something else. And I think it's important that we do approach challenges. And let's face it, as people with um, little or no sight, we, we face them every day. Um, and they are an opportunity to actually learn from, to improve our performance upon, 
and generally make movement forward. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that for the moment. Third well, that, bring, that brings you to the third rule, which is learn or improve a skill every day. Yeah. Now, I think this is particularly important and it also ties in with the second one to a certain extent. If you find something which is a bit difficult to do, for example, um, one of the things I found extraordinarily difficult was putting plugs in a socket. Oh, God, <laughs> tell me about it. Right. <sighs> it's amazing. Um, if you actually devote 10 minutes a day to practice doing it, in a week, you'll wonder what the fuss was about. <laughs> it's that simple. So you come across something that you have difficulty with, okay, devote time to treat it as a skill you have to learn. Simon, how long, did it, it. how long did it take you to engage zippers? Zippers? Zippers, yes, zippers. to engage no zippers. No, no problem. Well, I wish I right. could say that. Right. Okay. How often do you look? I mean, I'm assuming you're talking about a jacket where you put the zipper. Yeah. Down. Yeah. How often do you look when you do it? Well, when you I do all the time. I'll have I to try. Yeah. I, I get pretty good by the end of winter, but by then when fall comes around again, I'm lost. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. I've never looked at doing zippers up. It's just something I can do. It's, it's almost as automatic for me as putting on a seatbelt. Because mm. mm. how, how many of us look when we're putting on a seatbelt? We don't yeah. do it. How, when, we, when we were still driving, how often did we look at the pedals? Yeah. Well, and, and Thelma says, Thelma, Thelma, who's with us, says that she agrees so much with Simon. I like the fact that I have to find new ways to do things. And that she reminds us we have several senses, not just sight. So, no, no you're you're doing a lot of things with your hands, trying to find the 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 bottom of the zipper, the two sides, put them together. I've never thought about it. I'll have to do it without looking now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's so easy. Actually, sight gets in the way sometimes. <laughs> really breaking your neck trying to see the damn thing. <laughs> but okay basically if you if you every time you come across anything which presents even the remotest bit of difficulty practice 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 until it becomes second nature and if you do that you do make a point of doing that if you look back after a couple of months at what you could do and what you can do now you will be stunned I'm telling you that now. This is all about managing your sight loss. It's about taking a positive, um, a positive approach to it, not regarding it as an affliction, not regarding it as a curse, but as an inconvenience which you have to um, adapt your behaviour to get round. Improvise, adapt, and overcome, and learn a new skill every day. You know. This is what it's about. I'm Both here ones. basically what I'm hearing you say is to be flexible. So many yeah. of us, so many of us get into the there's only one way to do this. And I've been doing it for 50 years. And I'll be damned <laughs> if I do it any other way. Because you haven't got you haven't got um you haven't got plan B to back you up. Mm -hmm. Plan the B life. being sight. Yeah. The art of life is in plan B. The art of life is having a plan C, D, E, F up to Z. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and you, know, si you know, in one of Simon's books, he writes, and, and if you stop to think about it, about our first, you know, X number of years, every, we, we forget how much we learned back then. Um, you know, maybe it's just, it's a second childhood. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so no. you you you've gone back to primary school again. Well, you okay. had to learn. 
you had to learn to walk, didn't you? Because with, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you don't know where your hands are. And tell us about that. Well, um, I mean, there are two things that um, affected me quite profoundly. Um, well, a number of things actually, but the two things that affected me on a daily basis was balance. That went for a kilter. But basically, yeah. balance is centered on your ears and confirmed by visual feedback. So it's yeah. almost like a tripod of balance. And we all know a tripod is the most stable form you can have. And the same with proprioception, the um, ability to know what your hands are doing. Um, again, I could do, I mean, I, 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 being a sailor, I can tie knots with my hands underwater in the dark. Um, so that is purely proprioception. Um, in the military, I could strip a number of weapon, weapons and reassemble them again in the dark. Um, there are a number of operations that um, everybody carries out without even looking at what they're doing. But the minute they haven't got plan B, which is sight, to fall back on, the confidence goes. So um, in all three books, I think, I've got the exercises to get your, um, the use of, the skilled use of your hands back again, but so that you know what your hands are doing. I also add to that, the ability to visualize what I'm doing. So my hands are doing what they should be doing because I've trained them that way, but I'm also visualizing and visualizing what I'm doing. So that helps. The only trouble with that is when you come away from doing whatever you're doing, when you've been visualizing it, you think, good grief, I'm blind. What happened there? But you forget, <laughs> you forget the moment you can't see and you go, One... what, what, what happened there? You know? <laughs> One thing that happens with, uh, with people with uh, macular degeneration and other types of blindness or partial blindness is depth perception. And, uh, you know, there, there are many of our members who have uh, fallen because, you know, you've lost that uh, ability. And yeah. uh, that's a retraining. I'll tell you one of the hardest things I did when we were going along... Um, Hadrian's Wall, which is Hadrian's the, Wall. Oh, yeah. Hadrian's Wall was the northern boundary of the Roman. Yes, uh, yes, Commonwealth. yes. And um, there's a one of the major forts is still there, uh, mainly in outline, but some buildings are still standing after two thousand years. It's not bad. I think those Romans knew about building, and. Um, I remember my, my daughter's with me and we went along this wall and I was quite happy with that and we came to the end of it. And I would meant going back about two, three hundred yards or jumping off the wall. Jumping off a wall when you don't know how high it is and you can't see the ground, I tell you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You were on the wall when you were blind? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, this is it's about four feet high. off that wall, not knowing how far the ground was, and not being able to see it. <laughs> I think it is that called faith? Faith, faith. in my daughter. Yeah. Well, how you know, Fiona, she said, oh, it's only a couple of feet that I said, Fiona. Yeah. I can't oh. see the ground. Um, yeah. How far is it? She looked at it. Two and a half feet. I said, okay. So I jumped. Hmm. I'll tell you what, my heart was in my mouth. Oh. It's, well, almost, you... almost like, it's almost like my first parachute jump at night in the military. Yeah. Well, you're oh. the guy, you're the guy who rode tandem in the, what is it, the velodrome where they bike velodrome, around yeah. and really yeah. fast. That was great fun. <laughs> There's actually a video of that on my uh, website. Have you oh, looked at it? Okay. okay. Simon, do you have a cane? Do you use a white cane? Mm. Yeah, sorry. 
Yes, I have Put a rose. Put your glass of wine down for a minute, okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you want, you want me to talk to you? Um, yeah, I have a white cane with a little desk on the end. Mm. Yeah. Brilliant. I wouldn't go out without it. I think last week I said that the hardest, one of the hardest things for me to do was to actually um, go out with a white cane that first time. But I've now come to the conclusion that um, a white cane is actually a badge of honour because it's saying to the world at large, I put up with the kind of problems you can't even imagine on a daily, yeah. if not hourly basis. So let's have a little bit of respect, please. Mm -hmm. Do you I'm find that you, do you get that respect? I think so. Yeah, by yeah. and large. Um, I know when I go in town, um, they're almost queuing up to help me cross out and things. <laughs> oh, I okay. mean, they, they, yeah. a number of people who come up to me and say, ah, I've got a relative and I think, right, this is going to be hard now. And they talk to me about their relatives who have got the sight loss and what can they do to encourage them. And, and I always start with where they're in the forces. They're in the forces, I give them a blind veterans card. If they yeah. weren't, they, well, have they registered? Oh, no. Well, what can they see? Well, uh, well they can't see my face at five feet. Well, then they're partially sighted, if not um, severely sighted, they're blind. Get them registered. Oh, that's in yeah that's in the uk in yeah, the yeah. uk yeah, yeah. Right. but um, that is basically the way people get put on the map okay may i interject again yeah sure okay um eventually i'm going to stop asking permission and just talk over you but that's okay well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay um you just made a very important point which i have had you know when i originally lost my sight you know, I was told, ask for rides, ask for help. And I said, oh, no, I don't want to be a burden. In actuality, people do fall over themselves to help you. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do. And can we, can we leave um, the dynamics of helping and refusing help to another night? Okay, that sure. Is, sure. Is a whole That's summer. a big topic. Right. That is a very, very big topic because um, yep. it involves the psychology of people asking, people um, offering, and the tactics to be used um, when accepting help. Sure. Uh, which includes whole things like status, um, uh, status, knowledge, um, basic skills, um, leveling the playing field and all the rest of it. So can we leave that for another night? Absolutely. Do you want to talk about, uh, let's see, the next one would be, <clears throat> number four is listen carefully, judge slowly, condemn rarely. Yeah. It's Do you want to talk about to, that? It's oh. difficult to know which one to take that. Yeah. One of the things that we are denied when our sight goes to the point where we can no longer read expressions is that we are denied something like 90% of the information we use to communicate. Very true. Because very true. Um, verbal communication is pretty much a late camera on the scene and the nonverbal communication the signs, the gestures, um, pitch, speed, um, inflection, uh, what we wear, how we wear our hair, where we talk, where we, uh, where we, uh, sorry, walk, and where we stand, where we sit, where we orientate ourselves. That is actually a language entire in itself, with a grammar and a structure of its own, which is as rich, if not richer, than the verbal language. When you actually look at it, the spoken word is a very, very poor substitute for the unspoken word because a nod or a flick of the head 
or a quick gesture with a hand can actually say a dozen things just by one single movement. It's right. very, very economic. It tells you about um, it tells you about status. It tells you about um, who who who's cop dog and who isn't. It tells you whether something is a threat, um, an opportunity, or just neutral. So we lose all of that, except of course for um, smell. Sometimes if people are really sweating badly, we can tell yeah. they're nervous. Or maybe they just don't wash. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to tell. But um, what we're left with really basically are two things. One is touch, which is why I say one of the, one of the adaptations we got to make as people who are losing or have lost their sight is to understand that touch is not um, a sort of random impertinence. Invariably, it is people substituting touch for eye contact. So they're actually touching you to assure you it is you to whom they are attending and not someone else. So that's something you, you have to learn to not only tolerate, but welcome and also interpret. But because we've lost 90% of our input, we have to learn to listen extremely careful, carefully. The way people phrase things, what they're actually saying, um, if they're touching you, what their gestures are telling you, what the inflection in their voice is telling you, the speed of their voice, what it's telling you. We have to interpret everything that that person is saying in terms of not only in what they're saying, but how they're saying it and whatever emphasis they're adding to what they're saying. So we have to listen extremely carefully and we have to weigh things up again in a very considered way um, because basically, as I said, we don't have the reinforcement of non-verbal communication. And to judge slowly, unfortunate as it may seem, because we have a disability, I prefer to call it an inconvenience, because we have this condition called sight loss of whatever degree, we are considered to be inferior. Therefore, to judge would be seen as something pretty impertinent. So you have to be extremely careful if you're going to make a judgment, how you express it, and where possible, avoid doing it because you haven't got the full picture. Okay? Yeah. And one thing I would say, too, is that it's similar to the problem we have in our group in that we have text. We don't have those other cues like the facial expression and uh, uh, those kinds of things. And we do have <laughs> we do have problems occasionally with that. So listening, um, you know, you have to you have to take everything into consideration. So right. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think the problem is. I mean, again, that is something I could spend an entire session on. Oh, I know. Because you know, people, people on the whole don't listen. But well, that's true. By, by learning to listen, we can actually level the playing field. Yeah. We can put ourselves yeah. on a level footing with other people. And if you yeah. assume that everybody else doesn't listen, if we actually listen, we're ahead of them. Yeah. Um, it's, we have about, uh, oh, 10 minutes or so, uh, and it will be an hour. Um, I don't want to lose everybody. Uh, we do have, do you want to wrap up with talking about number five? Your impairment is nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. So often we think that we, we have this sort of hidden attitude. What have I done in a previous life to deserve Yeah. This? Why me? Yeah. Why me? Forget it. It's happened. Get on with it. No, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's happened. Um, what you, 
instead of being ashamed of it, be proud of a way you're coping with it. I think that's all I need to say on that. Number oh, six. Okay. Number six, get organized. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, another me. whole but night. You can't, if you can't see like if you can't see life as chaotic, if you're not organized, if you don't know where everything is, um, and if everything hasn't got a place where you can go to it instantly, life becomes impossible. Um, I think that's, again, that's pretty obvious, but it's something, yeah. because I tend to be a bit of a chaotic personality. It's something I had to learn, and learn yeah. quick. Um, and we, again, a whole topic about what you did to organize the, and take over the kitchen. Uh, oh, okay. But yeah. well, that's, tell, a, that's, that's another session. I know, I know. Uh, what's the number seven, the broken glass principle? Right, broken glass principle. One of the things that we get accused of when we lose our sight is short memory. And that's because we don't have, in, in normal life, we see something, we clock it, oh yeah, we register it, sort of, we go past it, come back, see it again, clock it, don't even, don't catch. And then somebody says to you, sort of, an hour later, oh, where's my such and such? Oh, it's there, you know, because you've clocked it three or four times. Yeah. When you yeah. can't see it, you've got no means of actually registering that something is where it is. So you're... So you put your keys down, and you put your keys down um, with that thought. When you you can walk past them a hundred times, you won't see them. So you're then accused of having a short memory, or your memory's failing. Because don't you remember you put them on the side? Well, no, because I haven't had it reinforced by seeing it time after time after time. So basically, um, what I'm saying about this is, when you come across something that needs doing, try and do it there and then, because the chances are you won't have a visual uh, reinforcement of it and you will forget it if you don't. And the broken glass bit comes from what you would do if you found a broken bottle on the beach. You pick it up, make sure that nobody got injured. It's that, it's that simple. And yeah. again, um, you come across a broken bottle when you're ambling through your house, you pick it up so you don't get injured. Or you come across a pair of shoes in the middle of the floor, you pick them up so you don't trip over them. And you do it there and then because you know damn well, but you won't remember it because you don't have the visual reinforcement. So again, it's a, a way of circumventing. One of the things that happens to you, is, which is this apparent poor memory. Not apparent poor memory, just as your memory is being constantly reinforced by sight. Number eight. Ask for help. And again, that's another whole topic. How about number yeah. one? Um, asking for help. One of the things that when we do ask for help is remember we are representing everybody who is blind or short sighted. Because it takes one of us to be brusque or rude or arrogant or whining or whatever to put people off helping other people in the same condition. So mm. the way we behave is going to inform the general public how they want to behave with people in a similar condition. Yeah. And don't hesitate to ask for help. You know, Everybody needs help at some point. Um, like Mr. Putin, he probably needs a bullet in the head to help him. <laughs> Let's not. Um, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. I know where everybody, I help Putin. No, 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 Everybody here, everybody needs help at some point. Okay. So it's a perfectly normal thing to do. Don't be embarrassed about it. But at the same time, remember who it is who has the problem. And this involves the use of an I message rather than a you message. For can example, I have, can I have some help, please? Is better than will you help me? Okay. 
because the minute you mention the word you, people immediately associate that with being in trouble. Oh, you think that, do you? Oh, and where have you been? Oh, and what time do you call this? And what have you done now? Know what I mean? So you tends to provoke in us a whole series of defences, a brick wall that goes up. And so they, know never that way. Hear, yeah. they never actually hear the request. So an iMessage is so much more powerful. And more to the point, you're placing the problem where it belongs, with you. Yeah, I jump mm. in one more time before we're done? Yep. Okay. In DBT, we talked about how every interaction Every interaction that we have with somebody else, we have a goal. Now, the idea is not just to make sure that we satisfy our goal and come out of it with something, but we have to make sure the other person comes out of it with something too. You know, right. you come out with win, something. Win-win. Huh? Win-win. Win-win. Um, yeah. The other day, <laughs> I needed something off the top shelf. I thought I needed something off the top shelf at Walmart. I waited for some tall gentleman to come by me and I said, I'm so sorry, I'm legally blind. Could you possibly pick, you know, get that down for me? And he picked up this whole pile of about seven boxes of rice. And it was like, you know, I'm like, wow, I couldn't do that. I would have all those on my head. And he was beaming because I was complimenting him and making a fuss over him. I got my box of rice, and he got to feel good about himself. Right. Now, this brings it right back to helping. We have a duty to make sure that people enjoy the mm -hmm. process of helping us. That's right. Right. And Sue, and, I will, I will, and, that, that will and that will reverberate, A, for you, because they will want to help you again, and B, they want to help other people in similar situations. I feel very strongly every single one of us is an ambassador for people with sight loss. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important. And Sue writes a lot about uh, how uh, people want to help. She is, uh, she's always been, when we were in college, she's always been a person who interacts with people normally. And she certainly has, uh, used that ability uh, and and oh my goodness she goes places and does things uh, and finds the kindness of strangers everywhere you know um, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen people go well out of their way to help me yeah yeah and yeah I, I've always felt duty bound to make the experience as pleasant as possible for example if I go into um, a local store, local supermarket, I ask for an assisted shop. First question I ask is, have you helped somebody who is blind before? The answer is no. I say, right, these are the basic, these are the basic rules. And as we go around, I comment on their performance. At the end, I thank them, say, um, what they've done extremely well and pointed out one or two things that could perhaps be improved, but well done anyway. Now, well, that's an assisted shop. In return for help, I've actually given that person some training they can take anyway. But that that is assisted help in a shop? Is that what yeah. you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I make okay. a point, I'm actually making a training session for the staff member as well. Yeah. Something yeah. they can do elsewhere. Right, number nine. Number nine, check everything and go at your own pace. Yeah, people are always saying, oh God, he's so slow. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm slow. I have to do things in real time. I can't plan ahead. Yeah. I can't yeah. take a step. And also, I'm not that over, at that stage, I wasn't that competent with my what my hands were doing. So basically, when you're doing something, do it at your own pace. The minute you start to speed up, something will go wrong. Mm. Now, going wrong has two consequences. 
The immediate consequence is that you don't complete the task. The long-term consequence is that your competence will be judged. You will confirm their view that you can't do anything and they will go out of their way to stop you in the future. So you've got the immediate consequence of fouling up and the long-term consequence of actually denting your credibility, which is the last thing you want when you're struggling towards independence. Right, and that. as just to, we've got to, to wrap this up, I'll just say that uh, the last one is, do not be offended by references to site. Yeah. Um, you're gonna have to give me a couple more minutes, I'm afraid. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people talk about things in terms of site all the time. Uh, I'll, you know, focus on that in view of, oh, I see what you mean, see you later. We, we spend our time being offended by references to site. Oh, you're getting up because I can't see. Well, I mean, you might as well just hang up your clogs now. Um, <laughs> it's the way people talk. And I think yeah. we have to accept that is the way they talk. Um, if they start getting um, really snotty over it, yeah, have a go. But if they're just talking naturally, that's the way they talk. There's no point in getting yeah. upset. There's, there's far more important things to get upset about. What I'd like to end up by saying is that after I'd written those um, 10 rules, I realised there's actually 11th one. And the 11th one is perhaps the one that... Um, rules them all and in the darkness binds them, as Tolkien would say. It is the it's the um, it's the uh, the magic ring, if you like, and that's patience. Ah, Without patience. patience, you don't accept your sight loss. Without patience, you can't do anything. Without patience, you fall out with people. Without patience, nothing at all is possible. So patience actually runs through the entire set of rules of engagement. And patience is the one thing, if we are <clears throat> to go beyond mere survival to actually thriving as a sight impaired person, then patience is something we have to develop as a priority. Okay. Oh. Are you all right? Oh, hey fever. Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, hey fever. Okay. Uh, that's me done. All right. Well, thank you. Um, now, uh, Sue, last time you got him on video, <laughs> this time he came in and we couldn't get him on audio, but I think we've got it. Now, next time we do this, you're going to have both, right? It'll be oh, just easy peasy. That's so. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Simon, you and I will talk about the next session. I'll send you email and we can chat like that. And okay, it thank you. Thank you well, so did much. You find, did you find the economic um, cooking helpful? Yes. And I did post it. Thank you. Oh, great. Great. I did post it. And I'm posting uh, quotes from your books, as Simon says. Yep, and fine. so... Uh, yeah. I will I will send you the link to this uh, video tomorrow. I I need to get it edited, and I'll do that, and you can put it on your website. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks for listening, folks. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Enjoy Bye. your night. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.